Millions more young girls are destined to become child brides. The UN says if current trends hold, many will be under the age of 15. So how old is too young to marry? And what are the reasons behind the marriage of minors? This is Inside Story. It is a culturally sensitive issue and one that draws a range of reactions from different countries and different communities. The marrying off of young girls. Critics argue it's fraught with danger, damage and discrimination, a violation of human rights. And the UN is worried. It's predicting that 140 million girls will become child brides between 2011 and 2020. That's more than 14 million girls a year. It says will marry too young or 39,000 each and every day. And it's warning that of these, 50 million will be under the age of 15. Morocco is one of the countries where child marriage is on the increase. Latest figures show the number of young girls getting married rose to 35,000 in 2010. That's up from 30,000 just two years before. Rights groups are calling for a total ban on the practice. And the government looks set to bow to pressure to change a law allowing those accused of raping minors to escape punishment by marrying their young victims. For Inside Story, Russell Couch has our report. This young woman has chosen to tell her story in a quiet garden in the Moroccan city of Meknes, far from the house where she once lived as a reluctant and frightened child bride. Married at 13, an illiterate. Her husband divorced her after just a year of marriage. Even though he abused her, he remains a free man. He gave me red pills under the pretense that it was for my appetite. When I took the pill, I would sleep for 24 hours and awake to find I had been tortured. My whole body was full of wounds and I felt pain everywhere. I couldn't walk. Fadwa Misk is the director of an online blog in Morocco. She receives testimonies like these by the dozen on the website she created two years ago. The site's dedicated to female victims of discrimination that the Moroccan law may not protect. Take the case of a 23-year-old woman who is already the mother of an 8-year-old girl from her latest marriage. This exposes a kind of human trafficking, veiled behind the legality of marriage. Moroccan law prohibits girls and boys under the age of 18 from getting married, but judges can use their discretion on a case-by-case -case basis. The Justice and Development Party wants to make 16 the minimum age. Activists are calling for an outright ban on the marriage of minors. It's not enough to protect women and girls from violence. Feminists and human rights movements under the umbrella of the Springtime of Dignity Group have demanded the revision of the penal code entirely and have presented very thorough proposals. Proposals they hope will not just protect young girls but eliminate child marriage altogether. Russell Couch for Inside Story. Allow me to introduce you to our guests in Nairobi, Kakenya Nataya, former child bride. Kakenya is founder of the Kakenya Center for Excellence, a girls' primary school in Kenya. Joining us from Islamabad is Sadaf Raza from the Ideas for Life Trust, promoting, among other things, women's rights and education. And from our London studios, Naomi Williams from the Global Children's Charity Plan. Welcome, all three of you. Thank you very much for joining us. Kakena, you were a former child bride, engaged at the very young age of five. Tell us about your experience. Um, I grew up in a Maasai village. That's where I was born and raised. And at the age of five, I was engaged and was supposed to be married as soon as I reached 12 years old. Um, but because of the hardship that my mother was undergoing, I needed a different route. I bargained with my father that, I, he, you know, that he would not 
let me get married at a younger age so that I can continue with school and be able to help them in the future. What sort of impact did it have on you knowing that you were getting married? And I, I should imagine that some of your friends were not as lucky as you and did get married at a very young age. What was the impact on them? I think that, you know, we grow up in a society that doesn't know otherwise. We are molded and trained as soon as we start walking and being told how to be a, become a perfect wife. You are trained to collect water, firewood, help raise the other's young siblings, and everything around you is really to perfect you to become that perfect wife at 12. Uh, I grew up where we didn't know otherwise. I went to school, I was lucky because my mother dropped out of, at school when she was in, in fourth grade and she knew that if she had continued with school her life would have been better and she became my role model and the teachers that were in school, the, the ladies from other communities, I looked up to them and I, I thought that that's the life I wanted, that becoming a mother at 12 years old. Naomi, you contributed to this report on child marriage. Tell me about your findings and how pre prevalent it is that a lot of people felt that, well, this was normal. Yes, well, um, Plan International is really proud to be part of a global coalition of organisations called Girls Not Brides that are supporting this event and report in, in New York. Um, and that's a global movement of organisations in over 50 countries that are working to end child marriage. Um, indeed, this is a global crisis that we are facing. Um, every day, 39,000 girls are being forced, coaxed or coerced to marry. Um, and we know that that has quite a devastating impact on not only their lives, but the lives of their communities. Um, it can um, most often mean that they are forced to uh, leave their education, the opportunity to fulfil their potential. Um, and it also puts them um, at great vulnerability to violence, abuse, um, trans transacting sexually transmitted infections, including HIV. Um, we know that death in pregnancy and childbirth um, is the leading cause of death for girls aged 15 to 19 in the developing world. Um, and you know, their young bodies just aren't ready um, to be going through pregnancy and childbirth. So this is a global crisis that we need to urgently address and that's why PLAN through our Because I'm a Girl campaign is advocating for an urgent end to this practice. Sadaf, Pakistan has massive problems of our own. Has Naomi pretty much described exactly what's happening there? Uh, yes, uh, definitely. Um, at the moment, uh, if I quote uh, the figure of uh, girl-child marriage in Pakistan, that is 37%, and that is from a UNICEF report. Now, the situation here is that uh, Though it's not like uh, sub-Saharan countries and uh, it's not that alarming and that, why, that is why it is not taken uh, so gravely. But uh, when I see and interview women who have been passing through this and who have spent a lifetime into it, there are different stories. Now in Pakistan, the context is that we have tribal, feudal uh, culture which we whitewash with religion. So most of these girls which we see who are married at a young age are victims of, uh, you know, uh, uh, practices like wani and swara and watta satta exchange or barter marriages. And well, they don't have a choice um, and it's a lifetime of misery for them then up afterwards. Now research suggests that girls who get married when they're young are at greater risk from violence and health problems, and I think you've all touched on that. The International Center for Research on Women says girls younger than 15 are five times more likely to die in childbirth than women in their 20s. And pregnancy is now the leading cause of death worldwide for women aged 15 to 19 in the developing world. It adds that girls who marry before 18 are more likely to experience domestic violence and sexual abuse. And child brides affected in this way show feelings of hopelessness, helplessness, and severe depression. Kenya, do child brides suffer from more violence and abuse because they're just too young to be able to put a stop to what's happening to them? 
Exactly, and I think that you know we uh, the reason why I really focus on education is to one really to empower the girls to be able to speak up. Uh, they when they are married young, they are most likely to be abused. They are most likely uh, you'll see a lot of um, sexually harassment. Uh, there are a lot of uh, obviously we've talked about the you know the the deaths uh, during childbirth and and all that. And then most importantly, their, their dreams are really uh, destroyed. Uh, their life become uh, that of, uh, they, they, you know, they grow you know, old when they're young and their childhood is robbed de from them. And that is a very sad uh, story because a girl has a dream the same way a boy has. And my focus and a focus of our organization is really to empower the girls, to give them an opportunity to go to school so they can you know, get an education so they can better their lives. And the longer they stay in school, they will not be married at a younger age and they will not, they're likely to speak up against all the violence that goes on around them. Now, I saw you nodding your head there. I guess that education, education, education is key so that they can stand up and, and speak out, have the confidence to do that, and, and also better empower their families. And the end game to that is to bring them out of poverty eventually. Yes, um, you know, Plan is campaigning very hard for girls to be able to complete a quality education. Um, you know, we're calling for girls to be able to complete at least nine years of quality education. Um, and yes, as you've mentioned, one of the, the main reasons behind that is that education can provide a viable alternative to girls, um, you know, in contrast to child marriage. Um, and we know from our experience working with communities that if you increase not only a girl's understanding of her rights and the power and potential of education, but also work with her family and her community and traditional and cultural leaders um, to really help them understand that education can be a viable alternative. I mean, we know that if you educate a girl, she's much more likely to be healthier, as is her family and children, and indeed go on to help in, in poverty for her country um, and indeed the world. Is um, this a so education, um, excuse is me, jumping in key. here, cycle though that if it's happened to the girl it's likely to happen to her child as well that she will eventually find nothing wrong with it yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, these are very held, deeply rooted um, cultural norms that, that we are working with here. But I think that's that's really key to the approach that PLAN takes, is that we work alongside communities to support them. Key to what we do is working with traditional and cultural leaders. We work in over 55,000 communities around the world. Um, and we work with them to do their own advocacy and awareness raising activities to really challenge those deeply rooted causes to child marriage. Now, not surprisingly, this has prompted some strong discussion online. And these comments come from our Facebook page. Matt Gillett says, child marriage is culturally specific for sure. Just because it opposes a Western ideology, that doesn't make it wrong. Maria Alshimi says that this practice is disgusting. These marriages are cultural and only to satisfy the parents, with some even selling their children. I don't care what culture, it is abhorrent. Mubarak Jamel says, I totally agree with those who marry at a younger age because it protects them from sexual harassment, rape, illegal sexual relationships, so it is preferable. I think all three ladies agree, actually, that that's not true in this case. Palaver adds, who are you to rob them of their emotional and mental stability, to rob them of a life that they could have enjoyed before settling down? Those are children. Sadaf, let's pick up on that cultural point that was raised. Do you think that this could be a Western cultural issue? Well, you know, in Pakistan, the situation is very specific. So I'm going to talk about in context to Pakistan. Here, uh uh, the biggest problem women face is that at the time of inception, uh, she's been made uh, the custodian of family honor. Now she grew up with this responsibility and her position is really precarious in the community. Uh, even a raised finger, a raised brow can ruin her family, her future and each and everything. That is one very big reason because of which Parents, usually in the rural areas of Pakistan, like Sindh, uh, some areas of Sindh and South Punjab, uh, some areas of KPK and Balochistan, they 
uh, give uh, or they marry their daughters at very early ages. And I'm talking about not like in the teens, but even before that, like 9 and 10. At least they are put into that uh, nikah, the contract of nikah, and the, mod the marriage contract. And uh, the marriage is consummated uh, supposedly after puberty. So protection and security is one very biggest issue because uh, women, girl being the custodian of this honor, the family honor, um, there are blood feuds, there are enmities, and uh, often the women fall victim to all this. So this is one, you know, situation and uh, this mindset, of course, this is what we feel, that we need to change this mindset regarding girls, that people need to take responsibility of their own honor and do not put women at that position where she receives all this just because she's been placed in that position now uh, in Pakistan uh, the most uh, this is one situation another situation is that uh, girls are not welcomed uh, happily in their houses um, a birth of a girl child is not a happy occasion she is an economic financial burden and as soon as possible parents wants to get rid of her now that is another situation which puts her at the receiving end to all this especially to this early uh, girls marriage or you know uh, you know a teenage marriage if you call it we are one of those countries where we, if you are familiar with this, we, are, we have a Marriage Restraint Act and it's been passed uh, in 1929. But unfortunately, even with that uh, legislation, we have uh, the recorded number, as I have given, is 37. And of course, uh, the, uh, if you rely on, you know, if you look at it otherwise, then girls are getting married at 12, 13, and 14 okay, years You've raised an age, important point here, the fact that people can't on. rely on the law. I mean, Keken, you, you say that your father was a policeman and you had to go behind his back to get what it is that you want. I mean, how, how would it be possible to impose law when cultures don't agree with that law? Keken, yeah? Yes, I, I think, you know, sometimes I think we, we, we are so afraid of um, uh, implementing laws that are there. And, and the reason why some of our cultures are still behind is because they are not educated about the effects of early marriages. Uh, they're not educated that, you know, they're seeing the effect, but they don't know. They're not linking that uh, a child is dying when she, you know, she dies, she can die during childbirth because she's young and her body is not, they're seeing these things. But because they're not educated about it, then they're likely to stay in that thing. I think it's not about imposing the laws, it's about educating the people about the importance of letting the girls continue with school, the importance of letting them know that they, they, if they delay their marriage, they don't end up going into poverty, they don't end up, um, you know, their life don't end up there. So it's really not about the imposing the law, it's about educating the people about the law. So if people are educated, there's more chance that the law will then take hold there. Naomi, let me, let me just go back to something. We were talking about the impact of girls, and I find this particularly horrible. Uh, forcing young girls into sex and childbirth, I mean, it can rip their vaginal walls and internal ruptures cause, called fistulas they can get, which can lead to lifelong incontinence. I mean, basically leaking urine and feces. I, I should imagine that can make them into pariahs in their community. Yes, um, I mean, I think picking up on the issue you were discussing around culture, when the facts are very clear that marrying um, young has severe health as well as mental risks for girls, um, they um, experience severe um, vulnerability to violence and abuse and medical problems, as you've mentioned. Um, and that's why, you know, we see this as a human rights issue. Um, and the culture of silence just cannot continue while 14, you know, over 14 
15 million girls are facing you know this risk every year um, so you know there's a, an increasing and truly global movement of diverse organizations that are coming together to say that you know cultural arguments can can no longer be used um, when these are the facts um, and you know now is the time we have quite a historical opportunity that's taking place right now and we need to get behind that and join the plan to end child marriage. You know, let's talk about the biggest perpetrators. The UN has identified 42 countries where one in three children under the age of 18 are married. Statistics gathered over the last decade found that in both proportions and numbers, most child marriages take place in rural sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. Niger has the highest rate. 75% of girls there marry before the age of 18. Bangladesh is ranked the highest in Asia at 66%. Moving down the list, more African countries feature prominently Mali with 55%, Burkina Faso, for example, with 48%. Uh, now, Sadaf, I want to talk a bit about Jordan, and I was quite interested to find that many of the child brides are taking place there, ceremonies are taking place there because of the Syrian refugee problem. I mean, does something like that become a, a breeding ground, a, a happy hunting ground for for men who want to marry young girls? Um, if it is like, you know, if you go back in time and if you revisit the Awan War and when they, you have a huge influx of, uh, you know, migrants and they're coming from, uh, you know, wa uh, this war situation, of course, that's, uh, this happened in Peshawar in 80s and in 90s as well. Uh, girls coming from uh, uprooted families from Kabul and from, uh, you know, uh, different uh, provinces of Afghanistan and getting into, uh, you know, marriage contract at a very young age because the parents were really worried about. Yes, I can see that if it is happening in Jordan, uh, I have a chance of living in Syria as well. So I do understand there the trend is to marry uh, girls in, uh, you know, uh, maximum in 19, 20, 21. So, of course, when this situation is going on, definitely this must be one of the issues on the minds. And, and, and there's the, so the many issues, are, aren't there? I mean, and, and I know a it's a, a particularly gruesome subject that we're dealing with today. And in the half an hour that we've been talking, something like 1,500 girls have been married. Naomi, is there is there uh, a light at the end of this tunnel for this story? Is it going to get any better? Um, yes. Um, I mean, I think, you know, today as we're talking, a key meeting is taking place at the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women um, and PLAN and a whole host of organisations um, are supporting the Commission on the Status of Women to make really strong commitments towards ending child marriage. Um, and indeed, um, a whole uh, group of organisations are supporting the United Nations to work towards um, a UN resolution on child marriage. And we believe that that can really galvanise women momentum both at the international but also at the national level um, to agree really concrete action plans towards ending child marriage and that can mean working at the community level as I mentioned with traditional and religious leaders to really try and overcome all of the aspects of a girl's life that leave her more vulnerable to child marriage. Um, likewise at the Commonwealth level um, the Commonwealth heads of government um, in their last communique came out and, uh, and committed towards taking measures to end child marriage. So we're really seeing um, a huge um, movement and move forward towards ending child marriage and you know PLAN and other organisations um, are really supportive of that. You know we cannot afford um, to miss this opportunity. Kegenya do you feel that there is some sort of momentum to stop this and give uh, women and children the respect that they deserve? I think it's, it comes from both levels. I think that there's a lot of uh, international speaking and, and a lot of national, but until we really empower the local communities to, you know, to take action, it can just become a talk. And, and I, I think I go back to the reason that I, I've been able to work for the UN and, and I, sometimes you feel that, yes, the laws are there, but who is going to be implementing them? You, you start talking about the chief who is not, you know, the chief is coming from the same locality who believes in the same laws, you know, who believes in the same cultural issues. So we really, it really has to come in both ways. Let's, 
leads us inside story in that topic. Kenya and Ataya talking there. Sadaf Raza and Naomi Williams, thank you very much. Thank you as well for joining us on this edition of Inside Story. A reminder that you can find this program on our website, aljazeera.com. Why not leave us your comments there? Thanks again for watching. Goodbye for now.